welcome. Hello, everyone out there. And I want you to know that this is Greg Asia coming to you with the second part of the message that I brought a few weeks ago called The Importance of the Word of God. Actually, what I've done is I've inserted the word. So really the title should be The Eternal Importance of the Word of God. And I'm here with Demo Missions and Mark Rowe. And we're going to bring you part two of this message. And I just want to do a brief recap, a brief review of part one for those of you who didn't have the opportunity to see part one, uh, just to get caught up where we were. This message, as I said, is about the eternal importance of the Word of God. The Word of God is eternally important, and I will share that why uh, as I go through this. But the thing I want to focus on, as I said before, is I want you to just stop and think for the next few minutes of what I'm going to share with you and why it's important and to use our brains to think about the things that I'm going to share. Because one thing that happens in our world today, because there's so much going on, we all have many distractions. And, you know, it's hard sometimes just to stop and think about the simple, clear, plain things in life with respect to God that we sometimes overlook. So there are many arguments out there about God, even if he exists, which I mentioned at the last time, that's a whole other lesson, but you can't even look at creation and if you do not realize that there's a creator God who made everything, to think that everything we see just came into existence through evolution, just the Big Bang and just got here like voila, like magic, is really, it's beyond unreasonable. It's impossible. So there's a different people that have perspectives on God, even those that believe in God, the Bible, the manuscripts, science and so forth. We'll, we can touch on some of that, but the thing I want to uh, focus on in these messages are this. As I mentioned before, we could debate and argue about the Bible, how it was written, who wrote it, so forth and so on. But the one thing that I think you very seldom hear anyone talking about with respect to the Bible and its credibility and the validity of the Holy Bible is prophecy. Now, this message is not about prophecy, but I want to use prophecy as evidence beyond the shadow of a doubt for the credibility of the Word of God because approximately 28%, almost a third of the Bible is prophecy. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is basically declaring future events in very specific detail. And in some cases, we're talking about thousands of years before the event even occurred, it was prophesied. And you, I'll share some of those with you this time I mentioned this one of them the last time, but when you, when you look at the prophecies and how long before the event happened occurred, you can't just say, well, that just was a, a stroke of luck or it just happened. And I'm going to ask you, like I said before in the first part, be open. Now, this, these messages, I'm going to try to reach two audiences here. The first audience is those of you who are already believers. And I believe what I will share will just strengthen your faith and, and reinforce the, the this faith you already have in Christ and the Bible and strengthen you in your walk. The other group are those of you who may not be there yet. You have questions, but you're open. And even those that may have certain biases, if you're open, like I mentioned before, if your mind doesn't receive something, it's hard for your heart to get it. So I'm just asking you over the next few minutes to listen to what I have to say and at least be open to some truth here that I'm going to share with you in spite of all the voices we hear out there in the world, there's so many voices, so many philosophies about life, about God, but be open to what I'm going to share and at least ponder on it. So again, prophecy is clear-cut evidence of the validity and the credibility of the Bible. There's more than, now some of these prophecies might be a little bit, as you could say, ambiguous or fuzzy, but if you dig into them and read them and study them out, you'll see that these prophecies were talking about Jesus. There's over 300 of them that Jesus fulfilled uh, in his life and some to still come to pass. And then some of them are very clear and very plain. I mean, you'd have to really just totally have your heart made up uh, against the Bible in order to say, well, that's not talking about Jesus because it's pretty clear. Most of them are pretty clear. Again, some of them you have to study out and, 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 dig, and dig and find and, and see the truth there. So we, that's, that's the main uh, issue I'll be using as evidence, but I gave this example the last time, and some of you may remember it. Maybe if you haven't, I'll, I'll say it real quick. 
There's a gentleman by the name of Peter Stoner. He's a mathematician and astronomer. He taught at the uh, College of uh, Pasadena, California, I believe is where he was. And he wrote an article in a book called The Science Digest. And he did a mathematical study. Uh, I believe he had some of his students and some of his staff working with him. And they came up with an analysis, the probability. Now listen to this. This is really amazing. The probability that Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, would fulfill eight, only eight, of the over 300 prophecies about Jesus, he said the probability, the mathematical probability of that would be like uh, one to eight to the 10th power. One in eight, one in 10, rather, excuse me, one in 10, one in 10 to the 17th power. That is basically one followed by 17 zeros. That's the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling only eight of those prophecies. Now to give you an illustration of what he used to make that maybe clearer, because I'm, you know, some of us are not really good at math. I mean, I wasn't really good at math. I was okay, but history and science are my favorites. So it would be like a person walking through the state of Texas. Now some of you may not be in this country, but some of you may have heard of Texas in the United States. It's the second largest uh, state in the United States behind Alaska. Texas is about 270,000 square miles. It's about 700 miles in length, 700 miles in width. Huge state. And he came up with this analysis and said the probability of one person fulfilling only eight of those prophecies, Jesus, would be like one in 10 to the 17th power. So it'd be like blindfolding a person and having them walk through the state of Texas and putting silver dollars in the state of Texas, it would be about two feet deep in that state, okay? And putting a red X on one of those silver dollars and let's let this person just roam through the whole state and then reach down and pick up the one silver dollar that has the X on it. That's the probability, the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling only eight of those prophecies. That's just amazing. So. It's just really beyond uh, anybody to argue uh, statistically, mathematically, that these prophecies about Jesus would just, just, they just happen by luck. It's not, it's not possible. So that is an amazing illustration. And so again, why, why is the word of God important? Here's why it's important. Because Jesus made this statement over in John 12, 48. If you have your Bible, you can pull this up. Jesus said this. He says, the person who rejects him and doesn't receive his word, Jesus, he says, he has that which judges him. He says, I'm not going to judge him. He says, the words that I speak, they will judge people in the last day. And the, the verse before that, he said, he didn't come to judge the world. Jesus didn't come to judge the world. He came to save the world. But at the end of the day, when all this is said and done, we are going to, people will be judged. Now, those of us who are in Christ, we've already been judged because we've confessed our sins and we've received Christ, but there's a judgment day coming for those who don't receive his word. And he's like he said, it's not going to be him per se that's judging him. It's going to be his word. The word that he speaks will judge. So the question is how your life is right now. And more importantly, where you will spend eternity. Is that important? Is that important? Because we all know that at some point in time, we all leaving here. We all leaving here, okay? We all know that this body at some point is going to be, be done. It's going to run out of gas, so to speak. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be done, kaput. And we will be leaving here. And the question is, where will you spend the eternity? We all going to spend eternity somewhere. Because this body is just flesh, flesh and bones. And even though it might be decayed and in the grave, we have a spirit. I mentioned before the last time, if you look this up, we are a spirit. We have a soul. And we live in a body, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit is the real us. The Bible says God made us in his own image, in his, own, in his likeness, Genesis 1. God is spirit. So he made us in his image. He's spirit. We're spirit. The soul is our mind, our emotions, our intellect. And of course, we have a body. So the question is, where, where you will spend eternity? Is that important? It should be important to us. Because this life that we live is just going to be a blank in the whole scheme of things. So the key verse that I focused on the last time uh, was Matthew 24, 35, where Jesus said this. This is a chapter where they're outside there in the temple area in Jerusalem, Jesus and his disciples, 
And he's telling them about the end of the age, the end of the world. And they asked him, tell us when this, thing, when this, when this is going to happen. When, when are these things going to come to fruition? And he said, in the 24th chapter, the 35th verse, he says, Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his words will not pass away. The, King James, the new King James says, by no means pass away. So God, Jesus is saying that everything we see around us, physically, heaven and earth, it's all going to pass away. It's all going to be gone. It's kaput. But his word will not pass away. It will, will never pass away. So I, I mentioned the last time, I'm going to just hit this real quick, and then we're going to the new material, that um, Peter, over in 2 Peter, Peter shared over there in 2 Peter, the first chapter, about when he and James and John were up on the Mount Transfiguration with Jesus, and they had this amazing experience with Jesus, and Elijah and Moses shows up, and he was, what he said there in those next three verses, uh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter 1, excuse me, 16 to 21, he says, I didn't just make this up. This is not some fable, some fairy tale. He said, I was there. I saw this happen there right in front of me. I heard the voice of the Father speak to Jesus from heaven. And, you know, one of the things that we look at in history is that when, when people record certain events, they look at the credibility or at least the witnesses that, that, that experienced that event, and they weigh that, the scholars, they weigh that in terms of who was there and what they saw and what they said. And how far from the time of the witnesses testifying about what they saw to the actual event, what time span between that happened, which tends to give it more credence. So when Peter wrote that, as we recorded it over there in uh, 2 Peter, um, he, that, that was like in the lifetime of the people of the first century. It was about 30 years after uh, so the, re the resurrection when he wrote that. So it wasn't like it was decades or centuries later. It's right, and it's, a lot of those people that he was, when he wrote that, was reading it, they were there, they were alive when all that happened. So let's go into some new material. The new material I want to get to, um, again, is we are talking about the importance of the Word of God. You know, I don't know where you grew up at, your culture, but they had a saying, we had a saying sometimes in America in certain parts, parts of the country, wherever you were at, if somebody says something to you, and they wanted to um, uh, reinforce to you how, how true it was, they would say, you can take it to the bank. You can count on it. You can take it to the bank. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard that expression before, but that was an expression that I heard growing up. You know, if, I, if, I, if somebody says something to you, they say, well, you can take that to the bank. You know, what I'm saying is good. Well, we can't use that too much anymore because this is an interesting statistic. There's been 561 bank failures in the past 20 years in America. From 2001 to 2021, 561 bank failures. So we can't even say anymore that if somebody says you can take it to the bank and count on it, that's not even strong right there because, you know, the banks are maybe not as strong as people used to say they were, that phraseology. So over in Psalms, go to Psalms 119, and I'm going to share verse, eight, verse 89 in Psalms 119. Now, Psalms 119 is very interesting because pretty much every verse in Psalm 119 is talking about, is using the word, the word of God in some form or fashion. It refers to the word, it, re it refers to the commandments, which is the word, testament, which is another way of saying the word, the law, which is saying the word. The whole, the whole, the whole chapter, that whole book, that whole chapter, uh, Psalm 119 rather, the whole Psalm 119 is talking about the word in some form of, of fashion. And in verse uh, 89, it says this. It says, forever, forever, it's a long time, forever, O Lord, your word is settled. It's settled. It means it's established. It'll stand forever in heaven. It's forever settled in heaven. Now, you might say, well, that's heaven. What about earth? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Second Peter, let's go back to Second Peter again. Second Peter 3, 7 says this. Now this is, this, is the, this is a chapter where Peter is talking about the end times and the coming of the Lord, the coming day of the Lord coming back, Th these next four, three or four verses. But he says in verse 7, he says, but the heavens and earth. Now over in Psalm that I just read, Psalm 119, 89, it says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Okay, 
Didn't say anything about earth there. But over in 2 Peter 3, 7, it say, he says, But the heavens and earth, which are, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, ungodly people. The word perdition there means destruction. But the, the, the way he got to this verse was he was talking about the things that people were saying back then as they say now. He said, in those days, in the last days, there will be people that will be scoffers, there'll be doubters, there'll be critics saying, yeah, you know, we've been hearing that for years, you know, Jesus coming back, you know, they've been saying that since, and, and the people that he was referring to in this particular uh, book, he was saying, yeah, they said, to, they would say, well, yeah, ever since our ancestors passed away, they've been saying that, and they're all dead, and he still hasn't come. And we hear the same thing today. You know, you hear people saying the same thing today about, well, they've been saying that for years. I remember when I was in school and I was in, on campus with a couple of buddies of mine. We started a Christian organization there. We had these newspapers that had a big mushroom cloud on the front of it talking about, you know, the end time and Jesus coming back. And I had a guy say to me one time, he said, well, they've been saying that for years. Well, that's true. But here's a, here's a thought. Even if Jesus doesn't come back in our lifetime, which many people think he will, but even if he doesn't, when you breathe your last breath, that's it. You're in, you're in eternity at that point. So whatever happens after that, and he will come back at some point, but if, if once you leave here and you breathe your last breath, you're, you're, we're done. We're in eternity. So the whole issue of when is he coming back is irrelevant in a sense because once you're done, you're done. We're done. The fact of the matter is you, we will be in eternity at that point. So, but Peter goes on to talk about this here in, in that same book. He says um, in, the, in the eighth verse, and here's, here's another thought, and we've heard this before. It says, one day with God is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. In other words, time is irrelevant to God. I mean, we, we can't even comprehend that. God lives in one big now. So to him, time is irrelevant. It's a, like it's, a one day is like a thousand years to him. In a thousand years, like a day. In other words, it's just irrelevant. We get we are focused on time because we live in a, a whole different dimension than God. He's eternal. So to the eternal God, time is irrelevant, totally irrelevant. But he goes on to say in verse nine, that second chapter, uh, second Peter three, he says this. Now here's a here's a key verse. Uh, he says, God is not slack, or, or he's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. In other words, you know, he's not. He's not delaying this as some people think he is, but here's a key verse. He says, but he is long suffering toward us, toward people, toward humans. He's long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but, but, but all should come to repentance. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance. All, now that word all means what? It means all, I mean, you look it up in the Greek, it still means all, the word is pas. In Greek it means pas. And this, this verse is another verse that you know, I know some people out there uh, maybe have heard of or familiar with Calvinism, and I'm not going to get deep into that. Uh, I'm just going to mention this in passing. You know, when I first heard about Calvinism, I remember I was in, I was taking this class at this seminary when I lived in Missouri just to take a Bible class. I didn't even know what the denomination was or anything. And I heard the professor say this. I'm sitting in this class. It was the book of John. He said his father had passed away. He, he didn't know Christ. He died. He wasn't saved, he's lost, he went to hell, basically is what he was saying. And then he said he had no choice in the matter because he wasn't one of the one chosen. He wasn't, he, you know, he, in other words, he was doomed from the beginning to be lost. And I thought to myself when I sat there, I said, what did he just say? So after the class, I went up to him. I wasn't mean, I wasn't nasty, I wasn't ugly. I said, let me get this straight. You're saying your father died, he didn't know Christ, he was lost, but he was destined to be lost because he wasn't one of the ones chosen to be saved. He said, yeah. I said, well, how do you get past John 3.16 with that? John 3.16 is probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. Even people who aren't even Christians know that. I was watching the World Series the other night, and they were showing the crowd before the game. And somebody in the crowd held up a sign. You've probably seen this before in certain sporting events. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that whosoever, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How clear is that verse? Whosoever, whosoever. Peter's saying the same thing here. 
not God is saying, not willing that any should perish, that all, but that all come to repentance. The word all means all. Okay? And to even further amplify that, if you look at 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 5, it says God, it says he desires all men to be saved or people to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. All, it's the same Greek word, all, pas, everybody. So, you know, it's really amazing to me the philosophies of men that are out there that deviate so uh, far from what the scriptures say. And to think that God would just pick and choose and select certain people for salvation and certain people for destruction and damnation. I mean, you wouldn't do that. No human being would do that. And we're accusing Almighty God, our loving, loving Heavenly Father, of picking and choosing who's going to be saved, who's going to be lost, the elect. And they take what they do is they take scriptures that are somewhat ambiguous and they twist them to suit their own doctrine. But you can't do that. If a, if, if a verse is ambiguous or it might seem a little fuzzy, you just got to dig and find out what that verse is really saying. But you take clear verses like 2 Peter 3, 9 and 1 Timothy 2, 4 that I just read or John 3, 16 that are, it's real clear. Those verses are really clear. So obviously when you read verses that seem to be ambiguous or fuzzy, and if it seems to be contradicting these verses, then your understanding of those verses that God is picking and choosing, the elect, is not accurate. So what is truth? Okay, this, this question is out there paramount in our society, in the world. Everybody's searching for the truth. You guys, all these different belief systems, all these different so-called religions, and I used to like to use the word belief system, that's a better word, but all these different things that are out there, philosophies. So what is truth? Well, Jesus made it pretty clear over in John 17, 7. This is when he's praying to the Father hours before he's getting ready to be crucified. He knows his time is just winding down, and he's, he's praying, and he says to the Father, sanctify them with your truth. He says, your word is truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truth. Anything outside the word of God that doesn't line up to the word of God or contradicts the word of God, it's not truth. And people can get upset about that if they want, but you got to decide what you're going to believe. The philosophy of men, the philosophy of some group, or the Bible. But Jesus made it clear. He says, God's word is truth. He, he went on to say, actually, before that, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. That's pretty clear. Now, some people get, get upset with that and say, well, that's being very narrow-minded. Let me ask you a question. Suppose you went into a big corporation, I don't know, GM or some big corporation, uh, Ford or you pick a company, you know, Google, whoever, Amazon, and you want to you meet with the president or the CEO. And you go in there and you say, I want to audience with the CEO. I want to audience with the president. Okay? And they say, well, they probably first of all ask you if you have an appointment. And maybe you have an appointment. But here's the, here's what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. You just don't go marching in there and go right into that particular person's office. You have to go through somebody. The, his secretary, his receptionist. There's somebody between the, the average person coming in there and the president or the head of that corporation or that organization. So why do we think it's strange or unreasonable when Jesus said, no, I am the way. That word the is a definite article that I am the way, the truth, and the light. Nobody comes to the Father but through Jesus. That's pretty clear. We see that in the natural world, and Jesus has made an example of that to himself in a spiritual lesson. Now, over in John 18, I'm going to read a couple of verses here, but this is the occasion where they have Jesus before Pilate. You know, they accuse him, the, the Jews and the, and the Romans brought him before Pilate, and they were saying, you know, uh, Paul is trying to figure this out, although he was trying, he took the coward's way out. But he asked Jesus, he said, uh, are, you, are you the king of the Jews? And then Jesus said to him, well, are you getting that from somebody else or do you, or do you, you yourself believe that? And, you know, and so then Paul said to Jesus, am I a Jew? <laughs> and so Jesus said to him that his kingdom is not of this world. He said, if his kingdom was of this world, his servants would, would fight and they, wouldn't, they would not deliver him to the Jews. And then Pilate said to him, are you a king? Are you a king then? And Jesus said, well, yeah, what you said is right. I'm a king. And then Jesus said this in verse 17 of, uh, no, I'm sorry, verse 37. Jesus said, 
For this cause was I born. For this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. The truth. Everyone who hears, who is of the truth, hears my voice. And then Pilate asked him, what is truth? But before he could even answer Pilate, Pilate just walked away. So that's the question. What is truth? Jesus said, I'm truth. And what, and what the word of God is truth. His word is truth. Now, I'm going to, for the next couple of minutes, as I mentioned the last time, I want to give you some prophecies to, to me that they, um, they established the truthfulness of the word. Now, again, some people don't need evidence to believe the Bible is the word of God. I didn't need it. Yeah, a lot of people didn't need it. We just believe it's the word because we believe it's the word. And then there's some people who do need it. They need evidence, okay? So again, for those of you who don't need evidence, this should in, in, uh, strengthen uh, and just reinforce what you already believe about the Bible and just grow in your faith. Those of you who have questions, the prophecies are just evidence beyond question. I mentioned this one the last. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14, where the prophet Isaiah... Um, prophesied that a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. We will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Now, what a statement for a guy to make. Think about this. He's saying a virgin's going to have a baby. Now, obviously, those people probably thought he was out of his mind. If somebody prophesied that today, they think that we think they're out of their mind. But even the Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Think about this. Even the Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, and they believe that Jesus performed miracles. Now, let me ask you a question. Getting off track here, just a second. If you're going to choose a leader to follow, they don't believe that Muhammad, Muhammad never professed that he performed miracles, and nobody's ever claimed that he was one of a virgin. But Jesus said it, and even the Muslims believe that. If you're going to choose a leader, and there's other criteria and other characteristics I could share, you, you got to follow the guy who's born of a virgin and just doing miracles. But over in Luke, first chapter, that verse or that prophecy was uh, fulfilled. This is around 60 AD. This is around 30 years after Jesus was uh, uh, crucified and resurrected that the, that verse came into fruition. It was written by Luke the doctor who was a companion of Paul. But now here's one, Micah 5.2. Okay, this is about 750 years before Christ. But it's, he, he prophesied this. He said, but you, O Bethlehem, though you are little among thousands of, of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose going forth is from old, from everlasting. He's talking about Jesus there. Now that's 750 years before Jesus, okay? Centuries. And then that was fulfilled over in Matthew, the second chapter. This is, this is around, around, around 60 AD, a little bit, little bit after 60 AD. Again, like 30 years after Jesus was uh, ascended. This was, this was fulfilled there. It says, And when, Her when he, Herod the king, had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. He, they're looking for Jesus, okay? They heard about the coming king. And so the, the wise men, we kind of know the, the, the account from, from, from the Christmas season, um, and it was probably more than just three. But So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. So they quote to the king, King Herod, the prophecy that Micah spoke 750 years before this even happened. And so that's, that was fulfilled again in, math, in, in around 60-ish when, when Matthew spoke that. The last one I want to share right now, because I'm running out of time, and this, this, is, this is one here that is uh, uh, really amazing too. Uh, Hosea 1, 11 and 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Hosea 11 and 1, that was 760 years, roughly around the same time as Micah, before Christ came on the scene. So then in Matthew 2, again, we find that fulfillment. It says, God spoke to, the Holy Spirit spoke to uh, Joseph, and, he, and he, he, he warned him that the, the Herod was going to try to kill Jesus. So he took him to Egypt, okay, and he stayed there until... Herod died, and he knew that he got word Herod had died. But in the last part of verse 14 or 15, he says, Out of Egypt I call my son. That's the same prophecy or fulfillment of the prophecy that was in Hosea. The last thing I would like to share with you on this part two of this message is about salvation. 
people have complicated the whole salvation. We've got different belief systems and religions out there, and they all are based on people, us doing works, doing something to be right with God. Jesus came and took the penalty and the punishment for the sins of the whole world, for you and I. And all we have to do is believe that, receive it in our heart. The Bible makes it really clear, but as many as received him, for those he, he gave the right, the privilege to become children or sons of God. Everybody in the world, we are all creations of God, but everybody is not, are not in the family of God. You have to be born into the family. Jesus made it really clear in John 3, he said, you can't enter the kingdom, you can't even see the kingdom unless you're born again. What does that mean? Born from above. We're all born in the natural, but we need to be born from above. Jesus did it all. And we don't have to do anything but believe and receive that. And that goes against the grain of religion because religion will tell you no matter what religion it is or denomination, whatever it is, they tell you you have to do this, that, or the other. But it's, it's, the Bible says real clear, it's for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God unless anybody tries to brag about it. It's a gift. We receive it by grace. We don't earn it. We, it's, it's a gift. If somebody gives you a gift for your birthday or Christmas or whatever time of the year it might be, you don't earn it. They just give it to you because they want to give it to you. It's the same thing with salvation. Jesus paid a, an excruciating penalty. The death that he bled and died on that cross when they took him down for you and I because God loves us that much. So I just ask you to go to the, the salvation prayer on our website, on the demo's website here, and you can use it as a model. Just talk to God in your own words. He knows your heart, okay? The Bible says all have sinned, everybody, and fall short of the glory of God. But when we come to Christ, God doesn't see us that way anymore. We are seen as righteous in His sight because of Christ's righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness that He sees us as. So we're no longer sinners, but we're, now, we're, we're saints, but saved by His grace. Now go to the model on uh, the website here and look at the, uh, the model prayer for salvation. And just read that, talk to God, and, and receive Christ into your life. He will change your life. The Bible says anybody that's in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things become new in our spirit realm. God bless you.